change is the subject that defines every known science. If there would be no change, we would have no questions to ask because everything that is of a static nature, everything that stays the same, does not require neither explanation nor an action. Change brings always up the consequences of what change brings about. The issue of change is not so much a philosophic issue as it is a practical issue. We are adapting to change. Obviously, the stones and everything else that is not living is not adapting. The notion of adaptivity is co-substantial with the notion of being alive. And probably the most important distinction between what is alive and what is not alive is the fact that neither stones nor water nor anything else that is not alive are born or die. To be alive and to die is strictly a characteristic of the living. Within the many explanations given to how things change around us, to how we ourselves change, there are some that come from the most established science, which is physics, and its cousin, chemistry, and its many, many other relatives that grow from this body of knowledge called physics, which at the beginning was derived from the Greek notion of physis, which meant nothing more and nothing less than nature. In other words, the integration of all that there is in this world. But physis episteme, which means the knowledge of nature, is a knowledge that corresponds to the fact that in reality that which is living is defined not only by its physical characteristics, by what makes it to be what it is. Indeed, the living is embodied in matter. It has its own so-called dynamics, comes from dynamis, again the Greek word, which means how things change, which are the forces involved in the change. The subject of anticipation and the subject of change are not simply uh, intellectual endeavors or they do not correspond to uh, our uh, intellectual curiosity per se. They correspond to the practical needs that are related to the fact that the living as opposed to the non-living is trying to preserve its condition. We have a vis viva, the law that Leibniz derived, that relates to the fact that energy is preserved. But regardless of the mathematical expression of the fact that energy is preserved, energy is changing from one form to another, in the living, the law of the preservation of energy is obviously as valid as it is in the non-living, but in addition to this, the living is defined by the tendency to self-preserve. In the process of change, the elements involved, the entity interacting with another entity, is subjected to what is called a force. That force explains to a great extent the way in which a stone over time might turn into sand. It explains very well the physics of the universe and we're very successful in applying the physics of the universe in building some machines that according to the laws of physics, allow us at this moment to explore this universe. 
in order to find out whether there is any other part of the universe where one could detect what we call life. There are, in the tradition of physics, four major forces, and we can talk about gravitation, we can talk about the so-called strong force, the weak force, etc. But they would not explain neither why nor how in listening to a piece of music or in reading a piece of poetry or in looking at a certain flower or in looking at somebody who we care for or the other way around. Emotions are triggered, feelings come to expression. Those forces explain very well the composition of our bones. They explain to a, a certain extent even the nature of the makeup of the body, in other words, the physiology and the anatomy. But they will not explain or do not explain at this moment how come certain actions in the living, be this a human being, an animal or a plant. Certain actions are not defined only by a past state, but in addition to the past state, what is affecting the behavior is also a possible future state. The notion of possible future state, which brings up the a vast domain of the possible is a notion that in, within, within the, the uh, physics perspective of reality is a no-no. In physics all there is is of a deterministic nature in which some cause in the past is going to, be a certain, to have a certain effect in the present and probably will, can continue to have the same effect for the future. This definitely explains the physics of hammering and therefore we are very good in building machines that will do the hammering. It does not explain the fact that when you have a hammer in your hand, the whole body becomes aware of what is going to happen when that hammer will be applied on a nail. In other words, without having had any chance to have the details of the physics, how strong uh, is, going to, is the material in which we are trying to nail something, uh, how heavy is uh, the hammer, we are able to take the hammer and, in anticipation of the action, the body is prepared to perform it. The hammer does not fly away from your hand unless you are a child, you did not have enough learning in order to achieve that level of anticipation expression, or you are aging and you start losing anticipation, in which case the hammering starts being a major physical uh, challenge. It is exactly the fact that the living is not reducible to a machine, not reducible to physical phenomena, that we cannot, with any benefit to our knowledge, describe the functioning of the living in terms of probabilities. The probability that a new newly born will become a violent play, player or a dancer or will end up as a drunk addict or who knows what else is something that within the mechanistically driven minds of some people involved in statistics might be an interesting question. When it comes to anticipation we are talking about the fact that the living unfolds in such a manner that it corresponds to the richness of interactions in which that particular individual from a species is going to evolve. Change is the outcome of interactions. Interactions of a physical nature, 
are quite well described in the laws of physics. If you are interested in the domain knowledge of physics, you better pay attention to understanding those laws and understanding the language in which they are given, which is the language of mathematics. If you are, however, interested in living processes, you have to give up the illusion that living processes can be described by laws. Physics, chemistry, and quite a number of other sciences are subject to descriptions that capture their regularity and which we call, as I said before, laws. This is the nomothetic domain, the domain of knowledge in which if you know the law, you can generalize from what is to what will be. In the living, you cannot, you don't have the luxury of such a generalization. Anticipation is characteristic and I would go as far as to say definitory of the living in the sense that the living is embodied in matter, but as such, the living is adaptive, the living is purposeful, and more important, the living is able to learn. The source of any form of anticipation, even before giving a formal definition to it, the source of any form of anticipation is learning. We have recent research in biology, for instance, that shows that what we call instinct, it is the result of long cycles of learning in which a repeated behavior that happens to be beneficial to maintaining life is transmitted from one generation to the other in what we call epigenetic processes. In other words, the so-called instinctual, because we don't have a firm definition for it, is such that it starts affecting even the DNA. Obviously the effect is not from one day to the other, the effect is sometimes not even from one generation to the other, but the dancing of the bees collecting the nectar from the flowers, just to give an example, is the result of such a learning process in which anticipation becomes a characteristic of their uh, existence. And there are many similar examples, not only the uh, dancing of the bees, there are many uh, things such as the fact that the newly born will find their ways uh, uh, to their mothers in order to get their first food. That is not uh, a thought behavior, that is a very much an anticipatory behavior of an autonomic function. The need to define anticipation as co-substantial uh, to the living derives from the fact that we have relatively good and sometimes very good descriptions of the way in which the non-living is changing. Anticipation being always expressed in action, the action through which the living is involved in change is such that the self-preservation is dominant. We have practical examples of anticipation in the way in which people navigate certain situations, how they handle obstacles, not only how we fall, but how we direct some of our activities. It is of extreme importance to make the distinction between anticipation, which is defined at the ontological level. In other words, anticipation is a characteristic of that which exists. And other forms through which we describe possible outcomes of change 
such as prediction, forecast, or ways in which we express expectations. And here the word expectation is describing exactly what that means. In this respect, it is always useful to start with the simplest definition of anticipation, which at this moment I'm going to formalize, but not for the sake of saying we are necessarily looking here for a mathematics of anticipation and a mathematical formulation of anticipation, but rather to give us a suggestive notion of what anticipation is. Within a systems view, we can say that an anticipatory system is a system whose current state depends not only upon previous states, not only upon its current state, but also upon possible future states. This is a future state. The previous state and the current state is if you ask the question, what's the relation between this current state of the system? We can say it is a function of previous state, current, and future. The easy part is to describe previous states. More difficult is to define the current state of any system, doesn't matter what it is. But the most important part and most difficult part is to talk about those future possible states. Well, one future possible state is death, the end of life. Life is such that it tends to self-preserve. Life does not naturally tend to self-destroy. The best example of what that means is evolution. Within evolution, the survival of the fittest, which was the rudimentary definition associated with Darwin, described more or less the dynamics of the living. It applies to plants, it applies to, the, to animals, it applies to the human being. But death is not the only possible future state. A future state can be that of a certain emotion, that can be that of a certain sexual state, that can be that of a certain success, such as you would like to reproduce on your violin a sound that you are aware of. You can produce this, that sound. And now you want to reproduce it on the violin. That is a possible future state. And you are going to play that string on your violin until it starts coming close to the tone that you want to obtain. It has nothing to do with the uh, uh, musical script. It has to do with the music that you want to hear, with the sound that you want to hear. The same applies for those who are very good cooks in getting a certain taste that is a future possible state. If everything would be of a only a physical nature, you take the substances, you mix them, and it's a guaranteed uh, success when it comes to food. That's not what the making of food is an anticipatory expression is. Obviously, and everybody Notice that in time, anticipation can be successful or not. And yet again, Darwin's laws of evolution are profoundly documenting how anticipatory processes are non-deterministic. The future is not pre-established. We cannot talk about natural entailment there are elements in nature that succeed, there are species that succeeded, and there are others that did not succeed. It was not due to catastrophes, it was not due to physical phenomena, it was due to the fact that, that 
the anticipatory expression was inadequate for the environment in which that expression uh, uh, was ascertained. It is important for understanding what does it take to study anticipation. First of all, it takes the understanding that you are going to look at the history of the living. In other words, the sequence of events which the living evolves from birth to eventual death. And that sequence is going to carry the information that you want to have, you want to have access to in order to understand anticipation. Second, while in the domain of the physics we deal with relations that can be very complicated, we never reach really in the physics the so-called complexity level. Complexity is characteristic only of the living. And in this sense, my own attempt of making the notion of uh, complexity a little more precise resulted in what I call the decidable or the undecidable. The domain of the non-living is the domain of the decidable. The domain of the living is the domain of the non-decidable, which means, to be very precise, we can never produce a full description of what makes up a living that is at the same time consistent. In other words, if we could describe all the elements that make up the living, we would probably find out very soon that the description is contradictory. It is quite amazing when one looks at the simplest possible living entity, that even that simplest possible entity, the unicell, is in the end undecidable. The change in the unicell is only an example. If you now follow up on the scale and you look at the species called the human being, the level of, the, of complexity, the G-complexity as I want to define it in reference to Gödel, the level of complexity is such that not only don't we have a chance to ever fully describe the living, but what's more interesting, what's more interesting, the phase space of the living is changing. For a physical entity, the phase space, which means the variables that we need in order to capture it, is constant. In the living, the phase space is variable. It changes. Once the living, in its interaction with the world, whether with other livings or non-livings, is taking it in, its own phase space is changing. To acknowledge anticipation and to describe its physiological foundation, among the earliest attempts are those performed by scientists that used to live in the Soviet Union, such as Nikolai Bernstein, just to give uh, the most remarkable example, but together with him comes uh, Anohin, and together with Anohin comes a whole group of people interested in how the nervous system works, etc. Bernstein makes the observation according to which the sensorial in information is very important in explaining the motoric expression. But at the same time, he goes away from what used to be the dominant model that Pavlov advanced with the reflex, his theory of the conditional reflex, that brought him, brought him a, a Nobel Prize. He makes the observation according to which the motoric expression is not controlled only by the brain, but it's controlled also locally. 
he comes with this uh, important description, which I will spell out here, which is repetition without repetition. Fundamentally, every process of anticipation is a process of asking a question and trying to give an answer in the action. The subject of anticipation deserves to be put in the context in which every form of scientific activity is finally put. What is the relevance of looking at that characteristic of the living that we call without having a big agreement upon anticipation. Science in general is not and was never an instrument for ascertaining that which was the dominant view at any moment in time. Science actually is all, almost always in opposition to the established. Science is not and was not focused on maintaining the situation as we know it and even uh, consolidating it, but rather challenging it, coming with ideas and explanations regarding the nature of change to the extent that most of the time scientific ideas turn out to be revolutionary ideas. When we talk about scientific revolution, we keep in mind that, or we have in mind, or we should have in mind that science represents a form of resistance to that which is no longer able to explain a certain phenomenon, certain phenomena, if you refer to more than one, or cannot explain why at a certain moment in time the potential of the human being, instead of being augmented by science, starts being limited by certain uh, so-called scientific views that turn out to be very constraining. I was talking at the beginning about the significance of the subject of anticipation within a society that is more and more involved in change more and more engaged, more and more uh, interested in uh, triggering uh, cycles of innovation that are uh, shorter and shorter. Technology made a huge, a huge, a huge progress in taking over, in automating a large variety of human activities. Technology did not make any progress in producing a better understanding of what motivates us in performing certain activities. How can we stimulate originality? How can we stimulate initiative? One of the main reasons why my interest in anticipation uh, remains probably as, as, as high as it is since the late uh, 1950s uh, is that I see in an anticipation a real challenge in discussing things essential to uh, 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 what we are confronted with in our days. We gave up education to models based on physics, chemistry, and to the reduction of the human being to machines. We transform the educational system into a machine-like system. We did the same thing with medicine. Medicine is at this moment nothing else but an extension of the chemical industry. We did the same thing in respect to social life. We tend to transform the citizen from an active a participant in social life into that passive recipient of uh, benefits that are then reflected in polls and the polls are 
then translated as that's what people want. The fact that people's participation in the political events is diminished continuously is reflected in the nature of action-reaction political systems which are never, but never focused on what it means to allow the human being to unfold his or her talents, rather what it means to create conditions for having the human being more and more limited in expressing uh, their sovereignty. So, the subject of anticipation, as exciting as it is within the specific science that it brings with it, is even more exciting when we look at it from the perspective of the critical condition in which society is today.